guys talk. Well, good morning, guys. Um, we're going to talk about thoracic trauma. A lot of this discussion is going to be a little hospital-centered, so we're going to delve into the hospital side a little bit more than the field, which I hope is, is okay with everybody. If you guys have any questions, do you want me to do questions because we're videotaping at the end or during it? Uh, whatever you want to do. What it's up to best? you. Uh, we can leave it to the end if you want. Okay, just because of the videotaping? Yeah, we'll record everything no matter what you're doing, and it can be edited also at the end point, but if you want, we can turn on the lights at that point, and I can even put you on the camera if they're talking. What I can go through okay. on that. So if if everybody's okay, okay, let's maybe, normally we don't like to do it. Let's hold the questions to the end because of the videotape and make it a little bit smoother. So let's just jump right into this. I'm going to cover um, the following topics about thoracic trauma, <clears throat> a little bit about anatomy, some me mechanics in the field and vectors, forces, a really important topic in the chest called silent injuries. I probably don't do enough on this, but hopefully that will become important uh, about silent injuries. I'm going to talk about different types of diagnostic tests that we use on a practical daily basis in the emergency room. Some of those are applicable to the field. Some of them, like a CAT scan, could obviously only be done in a hospital. Then we're going to break down injuries into the type that should be picked up in a primary survey and then in a secondary survey. Uh, we're going to get into ER thoracotomy because we've already done three or four at Havasu. I want you guys to know why we do ER thoracotomies, when we do them, when we don't do them, because it's very applicable to what you're doing in the field. And then if there's time, we're going to go through some select cases and sort of jump around a little bit there. That's our agenda. From an, an anatomy point of view, the torso is not simple. It's divided into three zones. There's the upper zone called zone one. There's the middle zone called zone two. And the bottom zone called zone three. And zone one is the pure chest. It's where everything in the chest is in, in case is in zone one. So zone one is got your heart and lungs in there. <laughs> zone three is purely stuff in the abdominal cavity. But the tricky one is in zone two. And that's in the middle. And that's where... Part of it's your chest and part of it's your abdominal cavity. An example would be the liver. <clears throat> if you shot a bullet right through the middle of your torso, right about the level of your belly button, that bullet's going to go through not just your liver, but it's going to go through your diaphragm and hit the bottom part of your lung. So when we start to evaluate patients and we have people with pain uh, from, gunshot, from car accidents or penetrating trauma in the middle, that zone two is a, tr is a tricky zone. The uh, chest cavity, unlike the abdominal cavity, has a suit of armor around it, specifically the sternum, the ribs, and the spine itself, too. Internally, you've seen this in anatomy classes before. You have some of the key organs, such as the heart. The, the, and I think I could point with this. The heart, the lungs, the aorta, the uh, venous structures here. One thing I want to point out in particular when it comes to vectors and injury is what happens to the aorta. As you all know, the aorta comes off the heart, goes up, makes a circle, and then dives. You can't see it here, but it dives down. From the heart <clears throat> up to where it has a branch that goes to your arm called the subclavian artery, up until that point, the heart, I'm sorry, the aorta is fixed. It doesn't move. There's ligaments holding it in place. But from where that blood vessel is, the subclavian artery, from there downward, it's flexible. There's not as much ligaments. And so right in that junction is a shear spot. And that's where the aortic injuries take place 85 to 90% of the time. So if you're going to have an aortic injury, it's going to take place right on the left side, right where the subclavian artery takes off and goes up this way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to some vectors. Okay, I want to then talk about biomechanics and vectors. This really applies to blunt trauma, and most of this on this slide has to do with, um, with car accidents. It also would apply to uh, a fall or something if you thought about it, but a frontal impact has a high chance of giving you a cardiac contusion or laceration to the heart, pulmonary contusions, rib fractures, and when you get a, a frontal contusion, <clears throat> It's sort of like a wishbone. You're going to break the ribs out laterally to the side, not in the front necessarily, and then potentially sternal fractures. 
If you get a sternal fracture, what's right below the sternum? Well, I can't, I can't ask him questions, right, because we're taping it. But it's the heart. So if you get a sternal fracture, bent steering wheel, old person sternal fracture, there's enough force that's been applied, and then there's a moderate chance the heart could have had a contusion to it too. So when we see people with bent steering wheels, high impact, frontal impact, especially on 95, and if the sternum's broken, we begin to think about a cardiac contusion. Rear impacts appear to be the same as a frontal impact, but there's lesser energy because of the seat. So it appears that the injury pattern is a little bit less. And then the unique one is a side impact. A side impact for us, we're thinking about all sorts of injuries, but the one in particular is an aortic injury. Because when you hit the aorta from the side, then you have that thing going on where part of the aorta is fixed and part of it's not. And you can get the bottom of the aorta to move, and that's going to tear the aorta. So I get really concerned about a high-speed side impact in the aorta itself. Um, my favorite equation, um, and this is probably the only reason I like math back way back one, is this equation. It's the force equation. And it's critical in what you do, what we do, and it's also very important in how the field talks to the ER because we need to understand kinetic energy. We may not come out asking the ER what was the kinetic energy, but I think doctors that are pretty smart are going to pay attention to what the field is saying about the forces, where they came from, and the speed because it translates into kinetic energy. And every kind of trauma has kinetic energy involved. The obvious one is a car accident. We always think of car accidents with kinetic energy. Then the, the energy formula is mv squared. It's mass times the velocity squared. So out of that equation, the most important factor to understand is not so much how much the car weighs, which is important because a semi versus a, uh, a little two-door car, the energy is going to be more negative onto the car than the semi. But it's the, it's the speed that's important. We're going to talk about that in a subsequent slide. So people think about the, the energy, the, the uh, kinetic energy, and specifically with car accidents, it applies to a skydiver, someone who falls off a cliff, but it also applies to penetrating trauma. And for those of you that have military training, you know with a, high, with a uh, military assault rifle, there's a zone of energy, so a small little bullet is going to have an energy zone that could be seven or eight inches wide. But even a stab wound from a, a knife has kinetic energy. That force is going to cause some kinetic energy. It's a small amount. So the take-home message here is everything has kinetic energy. It's all applicable to our conversation in the ER. What was the forces like? What was the angles? Because I am going to then, as you're going to see in a minute, do my workup based on the information. The doctors that don't talk to you or kind of blow you off, are, I think, are doing the patient a disservice because they're not understanding what happened in the field. Okay, uh, here's something in particular that has a lot to do with rural Arizona and rural America, and that is the divided highways versus the undivided highways. 101 or 17 are great examples of divided highways. I would make the argument that it's virtually impossible to have a head-on collision on 101 or 17 because of the wall that goes down the middle. They're modern-day highways. And those, by the way, are, um, I think they're called Jersey barriers. <laughs> and 95 or other areas like that in which there's... Um, virtual little separation, those undivided, more older highways um, are, are a problem. And let's talk about an accident. If you have a single car accident on 101, it goes into an embankment. Let's say the car is going 50 miles an hour and hits a wall. That kinetic energy is easily figured out because you know the weight of the car and you know the velocity is 50 miles an hour. If you have a head-on collision on 95, two cars now, both are going 50 miles an hour. The speed double because it went from 50 to 100, but the energy quadruples. It's 400 times more. So the energy impact, if, you, if your car is going 50 miles an hour one-on-one -on -one into a wall, that's one thing. If your car is going 50 miles an hour and hits another car head-on at 95 at 50 miles an hour, the energy didn't go up a little bit or double. It quadrupled which is massive, and we are beginning to look, hopefully, with ADOT and the Department of Health on a combined research study looking at the differences in the highways in Arizona and the mortality rate, because I feel it's going to be significant. You may already know that intuitively if you've worked in two different systems, but we're going to try to, try to uh, measure that. 
Okay. Here's a little bit of a, a commercial, and it comes back to interactions between the field and the ER. Um, I've always thought it's very important because of these things we just talked about. I need to know from you, where was the force? Was it frontal? Was it side? Did it fall down a cliff? Did it go into dirt? Did they go into concrete? And then your estimated speed, high speed, low speed, because it helps me define a diagnostic workup. Specifically in the chest, is that this is important because the chest has a lot of silent injuries. One silent injury would be a pulmonary contusion. A 20 mile an hour car accident um, on some little side road, is the chances of a pulmonary contusion are pretty remote. An 80 mile an hour car accident that tumbles over the expressway and hits a wall is a great chance of a pulmonary contusion I may not see either one of them on a chest x-ray because the chest x-ray may not pick it up, but I might do a CAT scan on the person that's going 80 miles an hour because I could see pulmonary contusions better in a CAT scan. A better example would be the aorta. It's probably one of the best examples. A side impact, no, a frontal impact at five miles an hour in the Walmart parking lot, I am not doing a CAT scan of the chest arm because the chances of an aortic injury are virtually zero. A side impact on one of the major uh, thoroughfares with a stoplight going 40 miles an hour against another car and an older person, the chest x-ray may look normal, but the CAT scan may show an aortic injury. So let me talk about that a little bit farther, specifically about the aorta. Uh, you can have a major aortic injury, and I think I got a slide about this, and they just die in the field. They never make it to the ER. You could have a moderate aortic injury, which is contained. You get a hematoma around the aorta, and you could see that on a chest X-ray. But the really dangerous ones are the ones in which there's a tear inside the aorta, and it creates a flap. You cannot see that on a chest X-ray. Unless you did a CAT scan, you wouldn't see it. So that's when I would, again, base my diagnostic workup based on what the field says. And then some people might say, well, why don't you just CAT scan everybody everywhere? Well, it's really expensive and it's dangerous because it radiates people. Because if I CAT scan, let's say you had a bad trauma. Some doctors do this. Bring a patient comes in, they just CAT scan everything. That's $1,000 to scan their brain, $1,000 to scan their neck, $2,000 for their chest, and $2,000 for their abdomen. That's $6,000. And if you did that on everybody, the cost is going to go through the roof. You really need to be more selective. So... The summary here is I think the field information is important because it helps us figure out our diagnostic workup. They may not come out and tell you, but that's what they should be doing. All right, I want to go through um, a couple of different types of tests that we do in the ER, and most of these you also do in the field. This slide uh, has got an arrow. Those two arrows should be here and here. So the physical exam, not listening, but this the physical exam, looking and feeling, you can't find a small pneumothorax in a physical exam. You technically can't find a large pneumothorax, but if you find someone with subcutaneous air, little cra crackles or crap, like the Rice Krispie things, you better think that there's a pneumothorax there. If you feel that in the field and someone's blood pressure starts to drop, I would start thinking of a tension pneumo. So anybody that's got subcutaneous crepitance, that's got to be leaking air from somewhere and it's leaking out of the lung and if it's bad enough to leak out of the lung, through the chest wall, below the skin, it's also pushing on the lung and probably on the verge of a tension pneumothorax, which you know how to treat. So crepitus would be an indication for more than likely a large pneumo. Pain where the ribs are could be a bruised rib or broken ribs. You don't know for sure. The stethoscope. Talks about in every textbook, but it, I don't even carry one in the emergency room. Don't tell Danny that. Danny, I don't carry one in the emergency room because I can't hear anything. Heart tones, you could throw them out the window. Maybe you could hear lung tones. Uh, you for sure, I don't care what the textbooks say. Unless you're in a super quiet area with a moderate to large pneumo, you're not going to hear a pneumo. Hemothorax is supposed to be dull, but um, even that is iffy. So the stethoscope in the emergency room is not that helpful. It may have been helpful 100 years ago when things were quiet and we didn't have a lot of x-rays, but it's not that helpful anymore. As everybody's probably seen us take a supine chest x-ray. When the trauma patients come in, we almost always do that. They're on a board. 
they're on the board because, well, we don't know if there's been a back injury or they're hypotensive, so we tend to take the chest x-ray initially supine. Well, the chest x-ray is great for looking for the lateral rib fractures out to the side because you can see them. You can't see posterior rib fractures hardly at all in a chest x-ray. You cannot see a small pneumothorax. And here's the reason why. When someone's laying on their back and there's a small piece of air or a small amount of air, it tends to go to the top part of your chest right in the middle, and there's lung right behind it. And it's kind of hard to describe, but a chest x-ray is just in two dimensions. So as the x-ray beam goes through the pneumothorax, right behind that is the lung, and it won't show up in a chest x-ray. So a chest x-ray that's supine does not show a small pneumothorax. It shows a large pneumothorax. It shows blood in the chest. It does not, like I told you a second ago, does not show a small aortic injury. It will not show damage inside the aorta. It will only show damage around the aorta like a hematoma. It will show, again, a large aortic injury. It doesn't really show small pulmonary contusions, but it will show large. Now, the small ones are important, too, in transport. So if you brought a patient in and we had to transport it to another hospital for some reason, and they have a pulmonary contusion, pulmonary contusions tend to get worse over the next 12 hours. It's just the nature of pulmonary contusions. So that's the chest X-ray. Now, an upright chest X-ray, which we don't normally do initially because of the reasons, because of the potential back fractures or hypotension, the upright chest X-ray shows one more important thing than the, than the supine one. <clears throat> because the patient's sitting up when you do this, <clears throat> if there's a small pneumothorax, the air goes up towards the top of your lung, and you can see that better. So a small pneumothorax can be picked up on an upright chest X-ray. Some people are using ultrasound more and more, and there is a, a new modality called M-mode. It's a specific mode, and it, the uh, M-mode in our studies have shown that you could actually pick up a pneumothorax. So uh, with a specific type of ultrasound machine with the right kind of training, you can pick up a small pneumothorax on an ultrasound that you can't pick up on a chest X-ray. It'll pick up a large pneumothorax, it's not great for a small amount of blood. It's really good for looking for cardiac issues. Specifically, is the heart beating normally? Is the heart have a normal uh, beat to it? It's not going to necessarily pick up the electrical part, but it's going to pick up the muscular part. So an ultrasound is really good for looking at uh, cardiac contusion, and it's also good for looking at blood around the heart as a cardiac tamponade. And then the uh, expensive workhorse is a CAT scan. Everything in medicine has pluses and minuses, and if you look at the bottom, the minus right there is you're not supposed to take patients to the CAT scan machine that are unstable. That's the last place they should be, and we really should be careful if people have renal dysfunction, which is a lot of our elderly people that visit here in the wintertime. When they have renal dysfunction and we give them contrast dye, that can make them go from partial renal dysfunction to renal shutdown. But the CAT scan has a lot of positives. It picks up all the rib fractures, no matter where they are. It picks up small pneumothoraxes, large blood. And then one of the critical things, when done correctly, it picks up an aortic injury. The problem with that statement is if the technician doesn't inject the dye right or the radiologist is not aware that it was a trauma patient, they may not look for subtle aortic injuries. So um, these, these types of CAT scans when, you want, when you're looking for small aortic injuries are best done in a trauma center as opposed to emergency room that doesn't really treat these kinds of patients. It does find a lot of pulmonary contusions, large and small. So again, CAT scan is our ultimate workhorse. It's about $2,000. It's not cheap, and it should not be used in unstable patients. <clears throat> We're now going to talk about um, the exam and the treatment in particular of what we could find during the primary and secondary survey. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody's been trained on primary and secondary survey, especially the primary survey. That's when you should find injuries when you're doing the ABCs. A secondary survey is once things have settled down a little bit, you kind of go back and look at the entire body from head to toe. The secondary survey also includes tests. So the chest X-ray results, the lab test results, the CAT scan results are part of the secondary survey. So we're going to kind of cover those two because in the primary survey, 
Um, you guys should be finding and can find life-threatening injuries, and so should we. Secondary survey is more of a hospital thing. Um, that's when we should find things that could turn into life-threatening injuries. And then one thing I don't have up here is a tertiary survey. A tertiary survey is a third exam done by typically a trauma team. It could be the trauma nurse, trauma manager, trauma surgeon. Someone is going to do a tertiary survey when things settle down. A couple hours later, a day later, two days later, when the alcohol is worn off, when the patient wakes up, a tertiary survey will find, it should find, about 15% small injuries. We just had one the other day. A woman came in. Um, you got, one of you guys maybe brought her in. She jumped out of a balcony, um, and uh, she ended up with a femur fracture. Anybody know that case? Yeah, and she, we bro found a broken fifth toe on her a day and a half later. And that's when her alcohol wore off and her toe turned purple. So a tertiary exam is designed to find subtle injuries, and it will find injuries. It's not designed to find life-threatening injuries. So primary survey <clears throat> picks up life-threatening injuries. Secondary survey picks up things that could be really bad. And a tertiary survey kind of mops things up, up, up to a day or two later. So we're going to break these next slides into those two categories, primary and secondary. <clears throat> so in the primary survey, again, this is designed to find injuries during the ABCs, during the acute phase, and you should find about, you can find up to six, <clears throat> six critical things. We're going to talk about airway obstruction, tension, open pneumothorax, flail chest, massive hemothorax, and a cardiac tampon. Now, those things can kill you quickly. And those are the advantage of being in a trauma center because uh, level three, level two, level one should be able to take care of <clears throat> any, any of these types of injuries seen in a primary survey. <clears throat> All right, first thing to talk about is an airway obstruction. A common example would be a car accident with a seatbelt, and the seatbelt shoulder strap is in the wrong spot. It's over the neck as opposed to the shoulder blade or the shoulder. <clears throat> and you might see what you see on this picture, a bruised neck. Uh, some of the typical clinical exam would be a hoarseness. You might find bruising or hematoma to the neck. And the issue there is you might be losing the airway. So these things tend to get worse before they get better. <clears throat> and you need to be on top of them because if you think you're going to lose the airway and you've got a long transport or we're, going about, to, we're about to put someone in the intensive care unit, we are going to think about intubating them and so should you. If you are too far down, you might think about a crike. So I think the take-home message here is airway obstruction. If you're thinking it's taking place, especially if they're hoarse, you might want to consider taking care of the airway before it gets worse. I actually have seen them in 20 years, one or two people where they got transported in from another hospital, and it was too far. We couldn't even get anything into their airway, and they just died in the ER from an airway obstruction. Okay, tension pneumothorax. Um, Everybody always thinks it has to be a large air pocket. That's what that slide looks like at the top, and that's what the, sort of the teaching is, but attention in thorax by definition is when you have hypotension, you're unstable. It does not matter the size of the pneumothorax. Here's an example. An older person, like 80 years old, has been smoking for 70 years, smokes two or three packs of cigarettes a day. <clears throat> Their lungs are not that compliant. They don't move that well, and so... When they collapse their lung, they may only collapse down 20%, but, and because it won't go any farther. But the pressure builds up so high that that whole lung pushes on the heart and the blood doesn't return correctly. So a tension pneumothorax, the more important thing is the instability. You might see neck vein distension. You may hear decreased breath sounds. But if you are suspicious of a tension pneumothorax, it's hypotensive. I would assume you would probably be thinking about putting a needle in there. Remember, they may not have a very large air pocket. The treatment of that is obviously the quick needle decompression because that has to be done before you put a chest tube in because the needle decompression is going to allow the blood pressure to come back up. And the reason we do it before a chest tube is because it just takes time to get the equipment in place. An open pneumothorax, uh, probably would see them more out here than you would in Phoenix because of the boating accidents. It is rare in most places of the United States. 
It's an open sucking chest wound. And that can cause, it's not going to cause a tension, but it's going to cause the, lung, the lungs and the breathing pattern to not be correct. So the treatment in the field would be a three-sided cover like he'd been taught. We then would put in a chest tube and then repair the defect, wash it out with antibiotics, and take care of the soft tissue. But the main thing is the airway first with the three-sided cover, which reduces the size of the pneumothorax if it's done correctly. Flail chest, it's talked about in the books and like this picture in, in which there's segments that are out of whack, um, like one rib broken in two places. To me, it's not so much about that. It, to me, the flail chest in my mind is more someone with, who's got a lot of rib fractures in one spot because they're going to splint and they're not going to breathe well. And therefore, pain control is going to become critical and you may have to intubate them. So I know the textbooks talk about this ma this this magical segment that sort of floats, but the reality is it's really just about a bunch of crunched ribs, more than one or two. And then we get to a massive hemothorax. It's, again, hard to hear in the emergency room. We don't typically rely on no breath sounds unless they're really unstable, but a massive hemothorax, the, the definition, by definition here, this patient should be in shock or probably is in some stage of shock because there's a lot of blood in the chest. The treatment for that would be a large chest tube, not a small little one, and then blood transfusion. And the blood transfusion could come from the blood bank. You guys all familiar with the massive transfusion? Can we talk about this a couple months ago? Uh, modern day trauma centers have not just pack cells, or, but they also have platelets and plasma ready to go. And so that's called a massive transfusion protocol. It probably goes back 10, 15 years so when we have a red trauma that comes into the emergency room, if we are concerned they're going to lose a lot of blood, we activate the mass transfusion protocol, which gets us in a cooler this big. It gets us red cells, plasma, and platelets. And then at our particular hospital, the plasma is thawed in a microwave oven in about three minutes. And if you go into Metro Phoenix, some of the older level ones, the plasma is still frozen, and it takes about 20 minutes. So... The massive hemothorax is treated with a large chest tube, blood transfusion. Usually the massive transfusion protocol is activated at a trauma center. Auto transfusion is when you take the blood out of the collection device and you put certain chemicals in it and then you can give it back to them so they get their own whole blood back. Um, going back to the massive hemothorax before I talk about what to do with it, where it comes from is typically a torn lung or a large blood vessel. It's not common. A small hemothorax, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is way more common. <clears throat> and a small hemothorax comes from the broken ribs themselves. There's a little artery that runs below each rib called the intercostal artery. That can bleed a small amount. The muscle between the ribs, when that rib is broken, that gets lacerated and those muscles can bleed. But typically, in a normal person with broken ribs, they don't get a massive one. They get a minor one. However, in the elderly population, those people on blood thinners, the torn rib normally wouldn't cause massive bleeding. But an old person on Coumadin, it could. But the bulk of the massive hemothorax has come from something big that's bleeding like a torn lung. So the, the treatment is chest tube, blood transfusion, and then it also could be <clears throat> open up the chest if the bleeding doesn't stop. So if we put a chest tube in someone and we get a liter and a half of blood out of them, there's something bad going on, and we're more than likely going to open up their chest in the emergency room or the operating room to, to kind of control the bleeding. If we put a chest tube in, in, in them and it's like five or 600 cc's of blood, but then the bleeding continues and it's extensive, more than like 200 cc's an hour, then we're probably gonna to go to the operating room. That's a massive hemothorax. And then there's the cardiac tamponade, which is again, another rare event, but think about frontal impacts, especially on 95 compared to 101. There's gonna be more, I think more cardiac tamponades and sternal fractures here than there's gonna be in Phoenix for the same driving volume. 
Technically, you probably would get distended neck veins. If you can hear it, muffled heart tones begin hard to hear. Shock, and you're going to see this typically on an ultrasound in the emergency room. So there's blood around the heart. It's compressing the heart. It's not allowing it to beat correctly. You're still going to see a normal EKG pattern, but they're going to basically going to go into shock. Now, the treatment for this is to relieve the blood pressure around the heart or the, or the compression around the heart. That can be done one of three ways. A pericardiocentesis in which we stick a needle through the skin into the heart sac and try to draw blood out. But that's kind of dicey because you're sticking a blind needle into the chest cavity, trying to drain the blood around the heart without actually hitting the heart or too, causing too much damage to the heart. We sometimes put an e uh, electrical low EKG lead onto the needle because once we hit the heart, then the EKG will change. But it's not as easy as people describe it, and it's not done that often. The next thing that's done, which is a little more surgical in nature, is something called a pericardial window, which could also be done in the ER. That's a little more accurate, and that's when the, the surgeon or the ER doctor would make an incision below the bottom of the chest in the upper abdominal cavity and then reach in with retractors and pull the pericardium sac, the heart sac, and the diaphragm up into the wound and open it up with scissors and drain the blood out that way. It's a little more sporting to do that in the emergency room, but it's more accurate than the pericardial syndesis. And the final thing is, the ultimate thing is a thoracotomy, because if there's blood around the heart causing a tamponade, that's bad, and there's probably something that's torn, probably a cut to the heart itself, and that has to be fixed surgically. Okay, we talked about the primary survey. Now, again, the secondary survey is when we go back and we re-examine the entire body, Let's look at the ears, look at the neck, uh, sometimes do a rectal exam, check the pulses in the extremities, but it also, again, includes all of our test results, the chest x-rays, the CAT scans, the blood tests. So all that kind of goes into a big picture, and that's a secondary survey, and that's when we would find injuries that can be really serious. So we're going to cover... Uh, four or five, we're going to cover the first six. The last three are pretty rare. That would be a tear to the esophagus, which we're not going to get into much, a diaphragmatic injury, or an injury to the, to, to the trachea itself. I want to cover the first six things. All right, simple pneumothorax, unlike a tension pneumothorax, has no uh, hypotension issues. The patient's not in shock with a simple pneumothorax. And then the question is, large or small? It's the opposite of what I said a minute ago. You typically think of attention as large, and it can be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. A simple pneumothorax in a younger person with compliant lungs and a non-smoker, you can have a fairly large pneumothorax, and it's not going to compromise the blood flow return. So it's still simple. It's just large, but it's not a tension. So tension has hypotension. If you have a simple pneumothorax, in addition to the fact that you're not going to be hypotensive, you're probably not going to have distended neck veins, and you may have decreased breast sounds, depends on how large it is. Well, the treatment here is changing a little bit. For a large pneumothorax, it's typically a chest tube. For a small pneumothorax, it depends on what's going to happen to the patient. A small pneumothorax, and I just had one of these about a week ago or two weeks ago, Young, healthy person with a couple rib fractures going to get admitted to the hospital, has no other issues. A 10% pneumothorax 10 years ago, everybody would have put a chest tube in those people. But we now know that a small pneumothorax more than likely is going to go away on its own. So someone with rib fractures, a 10% pneumothorax, you could put a chest tube in or you could just bring them in the hospital put them on some oxygen, check their pulse ox continuously, and do another chest x-ray in the morning. And if the pneumothorax didn't get any better, they don't need a chest tube. So we've learned over years that for simple pneumothoraxes that are small, we typically can get away with them not needing a chest tube. The, the unusual circumstances would be someone who has to go on a ventilator with a small pneumothorax with positive pressure, that could get worse, and those people typically would get a chest tube 
or a transport, especially in a single engine helicopter in which things are very, very small. If you got a transport from one hospital to another with a 15% pneumo, that person it, and it typically might just be watched without a chest tube, but because of the transport, they may then get a chest tube because of the transport. So I think the difference on this slide that messages here is um, small ones we can now watch that we didn't watch before. Um, pulmonary contusions are kind of a dangerous injury because they don't necessarily come with pain. So they're usually only seen on a chest X-ray. If it's really bad, they could have shortness of breath. And I have one of these about two months ago in which the lady had really bad shortness of breath and a really bad pulmonary contusion. A pulmonary contusion looks like this fluffy white pattern over here. This is normal lung. This whiteness here and maybe a little bit here is a pulmonary contusion. That's on a chest x-ray. <clears throat> on a CAT scan, they show up better. This is a pulmonary contusion here. That's a, basically a pulmonary contusion is a bruise to the lung. The little air sacs are full of um, uh, serum or blood, so they're totally not effective. They're just a bruise. This is a little bit of a hemothorax. This is a, a pulmonary contusion. So pulmonary contusion is seen on an x-ray. Clinically, they may have no pain because unless they have broken ribs, or not, this doesn't hurt them. And then the problem with the pulmonary contusion is the, body, is the thing down here. They tend to get worse. And it can be scary because someone comes in at like 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning from a bad car accident. They get admitted to the intensive care unit or wherever or the floor. And if their pulmonary contusion gets worse, it happens at 10 o'clock at night, which is the last place you want it to happen is at night. So pulmonary contusions do tend to get worse. When we see these in the emergency room, we tend to start treating them very early. We give them oxygen. We tend to admit them to the intensive care unit. We give them breathing treatments. We try to minimize it getting worse. If you have to transport someone a long distance from hospital A to hospital B, sometimes these people actually get intubated because you don't want to be intubating uh, in the ambulance and someone with a pulmonary contusion getting worse. So the message here is they do get worse. Uh, a simple hemothorax, we talked about a massive. A simple one typically comes from broken ribs and the artery that's right below each rib called the intercostal artery. So the muscle between the ribs is torn or the artery is torn. That can cause a small or simple hemothorax. And the treatment for this would be totally based on size. If it's small, you tend to leave them and they kind of reabsorb. If it's more than small, we tend to put in a chest tube because if we don't get the blood out on these larger ones, it turns into jello. And then that can cause decreased breathing uh, later on in life. Every time we do something, though, it can cause a complication, as we're going to see in one of the cases coming up. So just by putting in a chest tube, you would think that's no big deal. But anything we do that's an intervention has side effects. <clears throat> Um, cardiac injury, and there's going to be two slides that look similar. This first one is about blunt cardiac injury, and if you remember about the vector discussion we had earlier, frontal impacts tend to cause forced transmission through the sternum into the heart. Now, when it comes to a cardiac injury, it could be either a mechanical or an electrical problem. Electrical problem would be seen on an EKG, and that could be a number of different things from a lot of PVCs to tachycardia to bradycardia to some, some, some other abnormal pattern. So there's no consistency there. Just realize if you have an abnormal EKG with a frontal high-speed impact, mm -hmm. that abnormality could come from a cardiac contusion. The other thing it could be is purely mechanical. The heart's not beating correctly because it's bruised. That incorrect beating would be picked up on an ultrasound or if their vital signs are unstable. So the, the workup for someone who's suspected of a cardiac contusion needs to look at both things. It needs to look at the electrical activity through an EKG. And we typically, if someone came in with a frontal impact, like we just had a guy come in, um, motorcycle accident, about a week, three or four or five days ago, 
he came off the bike, hit a stationary object. His only real injury is he cracked his sternum totally in half. It's not like a little crack, but it's displaced by a centimeter, and it's, and it's floppy. He's going to have surgery tomorrow. Um, he had... Uh, he came in and we put him on the telemetry unit. So we put him on a monitored unit for two days to make sure that he did not have any electrical activity problems. So remember, a cardiac contusion could either affect the electrical activity or the mechanical function of the heart. And you would treat people that are having symptoms. If they're having an occasional PVC, you're not going to treat that. If they have a bruised heart, but their blood pressure and pulse are okay, you're not going to treat that. So we can treat when we find real symptomatic problems. Okay, the, we will um, talk about this particular slide. Which car do you think more likely has a patient that could have a cardiac contusion? The silver one or the gold one? I got one, I hear gold, I hear anybody for silver? Yeah, silver. silver over there. It could be either one, obviously, but more than likely with the force vectors, the frontal force vectors, the silver one probably be the one because the force is transmitted through the steering wheel, through the sternum, directly into the heart. So if I had to pick one or two people to have a cardiac contusion, I can only pick one, I'd pick the silver one. All right, now, sort of related to the heart would be the aorta. It's a scary thing. Um, people that have really bad aortic tears in which bleeding just starts going all over the place, they're dead in the field, they never make it to the ER. It's the ones that don't, that have a, initially a contained hematoma or a minor issue. So anybody who has a really bad one, they're dead. Anybody who comes into the ER uh, with, with injuries could have an aortic tear. Now, the chest x-ray here is a classical chest x-ray that comes out of a textbook. The aorta should look like a tube that goes up and comes down and be smooth. This mediastinum, the middle part of the chest, is widened. And this is the aorta that looks a little irregular. This is a classical chest x-ray for a probable aortic injury. But this would be the kind of aortic injury that you could see visibly in which there's a hematoma around the aorta. So it's got a crack in it, a little tear. It bleeds outside of it. It causes a hematoma. It pressurizes and stops it from bleeding further. That is a time bomb, but you can see that on a chest x-ray. But the scary ones are the ones you get that are a normal chest X-ray, high-speed motorcycle accident, and you still suspect there's an aortic injury, and that might look something like this. There's a little line right there, which is probably a tear or a flap inside the aorta. If you see that little line where the hand is, the first, second finger. So this particular person is not this person. I should have had a chest X-ray of a normal person. But this person more than likely had a normal chest x-ray. And the CAT scan was done because of the, the field information of high speed. So go down to this film. Remember we talked about that anatomy slide? The bulk of the aortic injuries happen right here. That's the blood vessel that goes to your arm, the subclavian, left, left sided subclavian artery. This part of the aorta is fixed with ligaments and doesn't move. This part is floppy. That junction right there is where shear takes place, and that's where 80 to 90 percent of all aortic injuries are right here. The treatment is based on the findings. So um, anybody with an aortic tear, oops, I think I'm the wrong way. Anybody with an aortic tear, um, it has to be repaired. And you just don't repair that in the emergency room. Typically, you have to go to the operating room. So if you see something like this ticking time bomb, what we typically do is we give them hypotension with a, a drip, get their blood pressure into the 80s, get them calm, give them uh, pain medication, which would decrease the chance of this blowing open again. So we make them hypotensive. Then we go to surgery, and they put in, they either take the aorta out surgically or put a stent in there. All right, going back to our little scenario down here, silver versus gold, frontal versus side, uh, knowing what we talked about, which car do you think more likely could have an aortic injury? Probably the gold one because of the side forces. And if you think about uh, the, 
Like the side force, let's say the force came in this way. This part of the aorta is moving this way, while this part of the aorta is not moving. So you're going to have shearing right here, and that could tear the aorta. So that's why, again, force factors are really important to, to, to know. Um, in fact, the, the guy had the sternal fracture on the other day. High speed into a, into a pull. Um, he was a little twisted, and I called the radiologist at myself and said, I know you're looking at this CAT scan. Look for everything, but be aware this guy hit about 60, 70 miles an hour. There's a concern for an aortic injury. And everybody's human, even radiologists. So if you tell them what you're suspecting, they may look just a little bit closer and find something. Luckily, the person had no aortic injury. So even though you guys tell us feel information, it doesn't stop there. Uh, I think you know good ER and trauma surgeons tend to let their colleagues know what they find. And on some of these really bad cases, we call the radiologist up and say, this is the clinical findings. This is what we suspect. OK, fractures. So I kind of lumped all these together, sternal fractures, scapular fractures, rib fractures. The problem with all these fractures is the bones are broke. All of these things, and clavicle too, which I forgot to put up there, almost all of those bones, when they're broke, don't normally get fixed. We tend to fix clavicle fractures by the shoulder that may compromise the shoulder from moving, but most clavicle fractures are not fixed because of the artery below them. It's too dangerous. Most ribs are not fixed. Most minor sternal fractures are not fixed. And by far, most scapular fractures are not fixed. So if they're not fixed surgically, they can cause and will cause pain. If they cause pain, especially in the elderly, they're not going to breathe well. If they don't breathe well, they can get pneumonias and infections and get intubated and die. So. 10 years ago, most elderly people with rib fractures just got admitted to the floor. Typical scenario is an 80-year-old person with four rib fractures, two, two rib fractures on the floor. Got worse two days later. They didn't get fed correctly. They didn't breathe well. They got a pneumonia. Then they got transferred to the ICU. Then the family came in. They may have had a family decision, and they decided to withdraw care. So that was kind of what was happening 10, 15 years ago. Now we've realized we have to be more on top of these especially the older people. So typically an older person with multiple rib fractures is going to go to the intensive care unit, and we're going to start pulmonary treatment right away and start nutrition right away. So it's not that glamorous, but the treatment for rib fractures and broken bones is more focused on pain control than it ever has before. And even then, if you look at the bottom slide, you're going to start seeing this uh, in the United States. The whole idea of giving people narcotics on top of narcotics is going away and changing and evolving. Narcotics are still important, but when I was training residents a couple years ago, I would come and make rounds, and I would find that patients with broken ribs were getting morphine shots, Percocet pills, codeine pills, and a sleeping aid. And they were totally zoned out. They were constipated. They weren't breathing that well, and we were having complications. So. I kind of learned the hard way with, with training residents that that's not a great idea. So probably the more prudent thing is to use different categories of medications, which is at the bottom. We still use some narcotics, but we also introduce muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatories like Toradol or Motrin because that's not going to cause you to be drowsy. We're doing more rib blocks nowadays than maybe 10 years ago. Um, we're putting in catheters into their spine called epidural catheters to help control rib pain. And this is kind of becoming in vogue nowadays. This is rib fixation. So this is someone's chest. They're up on their side. I think this is their, this is their arm up here. And these are broken ribs. And these plates are bridging the broken ribs with multiple screws. The literature is still a little unclear whether this helps or not, but we think it might. So someone with two broken ribs is probably not going to get this. But some person, especially older, in which there's multiple very displaced rib fractures, the pain is so bad that it may be offset by actually doing surgery, lifting up their skin, putting these plates on, and decreasing the pain of movement. So I think the message here is broken bones that move, that don't normally get fixed, are being treated with 
different categories of medications and they're being sent to the intensive care unit and the outcomes appear to be better. Okay, let's talk about ER thoracotomy. How many people uh, have seen an ER thoracotomy? Just one, that's it. Um, I think I've done, Dr. Butler, I think we've done what, four, maybe three or four in the last six months? I know I've done at least two. I think one of the other doctors. There's been a couple at Havasu. And, but you guys probably, before we became a trauma center, I don't think we were doing them because it wasn't yet a trauma center. Is that correct? Couple, okay. Let, let's talk. Not very common. It's you're going to start seeing this a little bit more. So I wanted to talk about because it's so visual when you come in the emergency room. What patients are we going to open up their chest, and what are patients are we not going to open up their chest? So the indications for a thoracotomy. Now a thoracotomy is what you see up here. <clears throat> this is the sternum here, right here. Ignore that incision because that's um, done in the upper room. But I want to just show this. Here's a thoracotomy incision. It goes up and down. <clears throat> this are rib spreaders here that spread up in the chest. This is the heart, obviously, but the pericardial sac has been opened. And this is the doctor about to do an electrical shock. And here's the lung down here. So an ER thoracotomy is a, is a resuscitative technique in which when you open up the chest, it allows you to do a couple things. If there's a tampon out, it allows you to open up the tampon out, open up the pericardial sac, and drain the blood out and get the heart beating again. It allows you to put a clamp on the aorta, which, if you look closely, I think is right here. And the aortic clamp stops the blood from going down to the kidneys and feet, and it directs the blood back to the brain to help uh, decrease brain death. So you can drain the heart sac, you can clamp the aorta to, to direct blood back to the brain. You could do internal CPR with your hands probably more effectively than through the sternum. And you can, go, you can deliver electrical shocks. You can also fix, which we've done in the emergency room, cuts to the heart with sutures in the emergency room. So an ER thoracotomy has a, does a lot of things, but it's not done for someone with a broken toe. So it's done. Um, the following reasons. We divide it into blunt and penetrating. We do it for people that have a traumatic arrest upon arrival, or they're in the emergency room and all of a sudden their blood pressure drops to 40, so their traumatic arrest is, is imminent. So those are the types of people in blunt trauma that we would do this for, and when we do that, their outcome is probably 1%, maybe 2 If you were to take someone in which you're doing CPR in the field, so studies have shown blunt trauma in which it's so bad there's a traumatic arrest in the field and there's CPR and transport, the survival rate is virtually zero. So we don't do an ER thoracotomy normally on a blunt trauma victim in which CPR is performed in the field. Um, you might see it be, being done in a training center in which there's residents because they have to learn this procedure and that, uh, it, uh, that, um, that is one way of training residents. The outcome is so close to zero that the reason you don't do it is because it's dangerous. When we open this up and there's broken ribs, the, the person doing the thoracotomy can easily cut their hand on the broken ribs. There's, there's sharp objects all over the place. The staff could get cut. So an ER thoracotomy is, is, is very dramatic. It's very dangerous. It needs to be done. But in, in a normal place with no residents like our facility, you wouldn't necessarily do this unless there was a reason. So the message there for you if you bring in someone with CPR from the field, unless it's unusual, more than likely we're going to call it right there. Penetrating trauma is a different story. The outcome, the survival rate with penetrating trauma is better in traumatic arrest, especially penetrating trauma to the chest. So someone with traumatic arrest from penetrating trauma in which CPR from the field has been initiated, but it's been less than 10 minutes, they have a survival rate, and we normally would open up their chest. You guys see the difference between blunt and penetrating? So that's, that's why we do an ER thoracotomy. Now, it says ER because typically if they're that unstable, this is going on. There's no time to go to the opera room to get everything out and fancy. This has got to be done down in the ER. If they survive the ER and the outcomes are pretty, pretty, pretty not that high, if they do survive this, 
then typically, well, well, then we have to go to the op room. So we open up the chest, we get things stabilized, we go to the op room to do definitive repair and, and then to close the chest. Okay, um, so up until now we've covered a couple of different topics, anatomy, we talked about vectors, like really beat, beat to death, that whole thing about the force and the kinetic energy formula. We talked about some silent injuries, primary, secondary survey. I told you that we do a tertiary exam. Uh, how much time do we have to do a couple cases? Six <clears throat> hours? Yeah. Do you want to do a tiny break and then do cases? I got four or five cases, or do you want to just keep going? I'll just keep going. Okay. You heard it from him, so you guys got to go pee. Don't just get up and go, but don't get mad. We, we, or we just stop. We've got to reinitiate the recording. All right, we're going to keep going. So we probably do like four or five cases. These are kind of a mixture of cases. Some of these are from Havasu. Some of these are one I used to work in Metro Phoenix. Uh, first case was a 43-year-old ATV accident, very sm kind of a low rate of speed, 20 miles an hour, and complaining of just left rib pain, no loss of consciousness. So kind of a garden variety case to start out with. Kinetic energy form is pretty low, so the suspicion here might be rib fractures, but I wouldn't suspect something else. Now, all these cases, the, um, they all look the same. There's an introductory title here. There's a history slide basically about the field. The next slide will be about the ER. When I do this slide, I have the physical exam of, of positive things. If there's any labs, I'd point them out here if they were abnormal. Then typically, I will group the x-rays into two categories, normal, and the normal ones I list, and then the abnormal ones I'll show you. So this gentleman had normal vital signs, left chest pain, just like the field. He was a little intoxicated. That's a 0.11. Uh, in field language, 111 for us. And because of his alcohol, it throws off the exam. He got, he got probably more CAT scans than, than he would have gotten if he wasn't drunk. He got a CT scan of the abdomen, $2,000. CT scan of the cervical spine, $1,000. And the brain, $1,000. That's $4,000 right there. Now, the positive x-rays are here. Hard to see, this is his chest x-ray, but if you look right there where that arrow is, and it's very subtle, there's a crack in the rib. There's also a crack in the rib down here. He has a number of rib fractures on the left, but those are the easy ones to see. The lateral rib fractures in the chest x-ray are, are easy. Trying to see broken ribs in the back is really difficult on a chest x-ray. That's what you see on a two-dimensional $200 chest x-ray. CAT scan, spend another $2,000, and this is what you get. You get more information. So this CAT scan is cut. This, this, this particular slice is through the chest, through the heart. Here's the heart. Here is the spine. And here's a great example of that particular broken rib. See how it's displaced? Go back to the chest x-ray. You can barely see it. Way better on the CAT scan. There's also a tiny bit of blood in the chest right here. So he has five rib fractures on the left. So five left lateral rib fractures. And so in summary of his injuries, there's rib fractures and alcohol. As far as treatment goes, he got the, um, the diffuse cocktail, if you want to call it. He got muscle relaxants. He got Toradol, then Motrin and low-dose narcotics with good pain relief. He did well and just required one day in the hospital. Now, typically, what I'm not showing you is what we also do. Here's his chest x-ray when he came in. If he had a hemothorax, you would see blood in the back of the chest here. The CAT scan just had a little bit of one. But over time, especially in elderly people, elderly people with multiple rib fractures can cause liquids to accumulate in their chest called an effusion. So typically, um, people that get admitted with multiple rib fractures, they get a chest x-ray the next day. I don't have his, but his looked the same. If he was elderly with five rib fractures, he could have developed liquid in his chest that could even require a chest tube the next day. All right, so that guy was a pretty simple case of a low kinetic energy impact who's intoxicated who got more x-rays than he would have gotten if he was less intoxicated. 
Second case happened um, in the Havasu area, male, female. He was driving. Uh, he had a frontal rear impact on, I believe it was 95 or one of the highways. So it's 60 miles an hour. Kinetic energy is much higher than the last person. Old people's bones compared to young people's bones, more brittle, so more likely to break. So with a frontal impact on an 81-year-old guy at 60 miles an hour, um, the good thing is he had an airbag, but we were still concerned that his sternum was broke because he had chest pain. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, vital signs in the emergency room, fairly unremarkable. Just like the field, he had chest wall sternal pain, which goes along with the force factor. His hemoglobin was normal. He ended up getting these x-rays, and he had no broken bones. Here's his CAT scan of the chest shot from the side. This is a side view. This is the sternum. This is the heart. Here's the spine. I would have bet a pizza they had a broken sternum based on his clinical exam. You could see through his bones. So he's osteoporotic. And he had a 60-mile-an-hour frontal force vector impact. There is no broken sternum. These are the normal way the sternum heals when you're born or grows. No broken bone. Still concerned, though, that the force went through the sternum and bruised his heart, so he came into the telemetry monitoring, had 24 or 40 hours of telemetry monitoring to make sure there was no electrical problems with his heart. So in summary, he had chest wall contusion, not a break, multiple medical problems, bad COPD. He was debilitated. His caregiver, ironically, was his wife. So on him, sounds pretty simple. No broken bones. Why admit him to the hospital? It was a good question. Because he's so debilitated, he's sore. If we weren't careful with this guy, this guy is going to get a pneumonia and, and not do well. And when you put an elderly person in the hospital, their whole cycle is out of whack. We typically, by, typically incorrectly give them regular foods when they may not eat regular foods at home. So you have to be very careful with the elderly. Plus, in the old days, 10 years ago, I would have given this guy narcotics for his muscle pain. He got instead anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, no narcotics, and we gave him Ensure right away. You guys all from the Ensure nutritional supplementation, which they can drink even if they can't chew. So he got nutrition, physical therapy on day one, anti-inflammatories, got out of bed, and were able to discharge this guy two days eight later. Ten years ago, this guy probably would have been in the hospital for a week or so and end up in a nursing home. Uh, next case. <clears throat> This is not the picture, but it's kind of a cool picture, so I threw it up there anyways. This guy was a um, 24 car accident, probably doing 100 miles an hour, estimated by the field. Ejected out of the car into a farm. The, ca the car was into the field fairly far into it, so it's high-speed suspicion of kinetic energy, also intoxicated. He was actually then transferred to a flight team and flown, and this was not at Havas, so this was in Phoenix where I work, used to work. This gentleman had a glass calcoma scale of three um, after he was intubated and got paralytics. He had a lot of facial swelling, and what I want to show you is some lab tests that you may not be familiar with. Uh, first off, you are familiar with alcohol level. That's a 0.13 in field terms, alcohol 136. This, though, was done about an hour or two after he came in, so it was really like a 200. He's acidotic. His lactic acid should be about one or so, so that means he's acidotic. But the most important thing is the flight team intubated him. We checked the ET tube placement. It's fine. And look what his saturations are. Normally, a young person have to be into, after being intubated would have a 97, 98, 99% saturation. I, I know we're on the video right now, but anybody want to guess why this gentleman going 100 miles an hour with, I can tell you for sure the ET tube is functioning in the right spot. Why would he have a saturation this, this high or this low? Okay, that could be one. What, what? So it could be chemo or pneumothorax. Those would be my top two. In addition to that, what else do we talk about today that would be a little more obscure? Think about the speed. He's going to have a circulation problem. What? He's going to have a circulation problem. Okay, he have a circulation problem. I'm going to tell you um, he didn't, but he could. So if he did, that would go along with that. 
If he's not oxygenating well, pneumo and hemo or circulation problem, the, what, else, what else could happen to the lung? Yeah. I'll come to that in a second. This gentleman, um, even after we, the paralytics wore off, wasn't moving, and he had a very bad brain injury. This is a cut of the brain that for probably the best way to describe it. This is kind of the bottom of the brain where the spinal cord kind of goes up into the skull, and there's usually a black line around this, and the swelling from his cerebral edema is so bad that it's cut off basically the blood supply to the brain. So this is, even though CAT scans can't say brain death, this is a CAT scan that shows probable brain death. Here's his mandible in at least three broken bones, or three broken spots right here, right here, right here. That's a piece of his jaw sitting sort of in his mouth. And going back to our saturation issue, this is his ET tube. It's above the vocal cords. It's right, I'm sorry, below the vocal cords, above the split of the trachea right here. The ET tube is fine. The ET tube is functioning. This is his left lung. That's the normal appearance of a lung. He did have a pneumo on the left side, so we put a chest tube. Here's his chest tube over here. So the left lung has been taken care of. There's no contusion. The pneumothorax is resolved. We are still having saturation problems. Here is his chest tube on the right, draining out the pneumothorax and a little bit, little bit of blood he had, he had here. The problem is this white stuff. Chest x-ray shows you things in two dimensions. You can't see in three dimensions. This white stuff is liquid. It's either a bruised lung or it's a hemothorax that the chest tube is yet to drain out. So go one step further into a CAT scan. This CAT scan is from the front. Here's his spine here. And since this is the level of the spine, this is towards the back of the lung. So if we were looking for a hemothorax, we would see it kind of on this cut. Here's his good lung. That's black, which is lung. That's normal lung moving perfectly fine. This is his lung, which you hardly ever see, outlined. Uh, it's kind of pretty looking, but it's not good. That's fluid all through the lung, a contusion, whatever you want to call it. This is a very badly bruised lung. Again, here we go. This whole lung has got a contusion to it. So this high-speed kinetic energy impact within a short period of time caused this kind of bruising. We had hoped the pneumothoraxes would have cured it. We would have hoped the chest tube would have taken care of a hemothorax, which it took care of some. What we're left, though, is with something you really can't fix. And that is a very, very bad pulmonary contusion, which only got worse. So in summary of this gentleman, he, because of the kinetic energy compared to the other case I showed you, the forces are so bad, he's got an anoxic lethal brain injury, extensive pulmonary contusions to the point where he's not oxygenating, oxygenating well, and pneumothoraxes, which were controlled. He spent six days in the intensive care unit. Uh, his brain injury was essentially lethal. We did a what's called a nuclear study of his brain, a nuclear flow. There's no flow, to the, no flow to his brain, and so he was declared brain dead. All from kinetic energy. Um, the next one uh, was a 74-year-old male, so elderly people, even though 74 could be the new 50, 74 could be the new 90, with some of the patients you guys bring in. This guy was one hour on the scene, uh, rib pain complaints, that's all he had. In the emergency room, vitals are stable, rib pain, chest wall pain, scalp cut, labs are normal. Didn't do a lot of x-rays because he's not drunk and the ER doctor didn't think a lot of x-rays were needed, which I would agree with. He ends up with rib fractures. Now, compare this film to the younger one. The bones here look fairly dense. This is a young person. And then you go look at this old person. You can see through his bones. Easier to break their bones. There's uh, rib fracture number four or five. There's another crack right there. He ends up with um, rib fractures three, four, and five, and six on the right. That's it. 
But like we talked about, elderly people with rib fractures can easily start to splint. They get too many narcotics. They get fluid accumulates. The fluid turns into pneumonia, and they just die. Here is, um, besides his rib fractures, I forgot about this, he's got a scapular fracture. So here's his scapula on the chest X-ray. This is the bone back here. Can't see anything back here. It's very hard to see rib fractures, but he has a rib fracture of his scapula. Scapula is extremely rarely never fixed surgically. It's just taken care of with pain medication. Anybody see this black stuff here? This is the very, very upper part of the chest, and I'm going to show you a little bit better in a second. That's lung. That's not necessarily lung. That is a collapsed lung. So this is up towards the top of your chest. This is a little bit farther down. Uh, here's his spine. This is the left lung, totally normal. Those are blood vessels in there. The lung looks great. There's no contusion. And here is a about 15% collapsed lung. You see it on chest x-ray. You don't see it on his chest x-ray because when we talked about earlier on, a supine initial chest x-ray does not pick up on small air pockets because it's sitting at the very top of the lung. And when the x-ray beam goes this way, you see it in two dimensions. You see lung all the way out. So take home message, uh, we don't see pneumothorax, on, small pneumothorax on a supine chest x-ray, but he has about a 15% pneumo. In a younger person that's just going to get admitted to the hospital, I would not put a chest tube in this person. In an older person in which the lungs are more friable, uh, typically we still would. So he has up with, with a scalp laceration, rib fracture, scapular fracture, and then the little bit of a worrisome pneumothorax. He did get a chest tube placed because of his age, and he was put in the intensive care unit. Uh, by the way, he did get intubated um, because he was a little confused at one point. But he stayed in the hospital about five days and was transferred to an extended care facility. So the message there is older people tend to go to the intensive care with rib fractures. Um, this one um, did not happen in Havasu. This one happened in Phoenix. It was transferred in from a very rural hospital. So we could have handled this person in Havasu. It just happens to be this goes back before I came to Havasu. This was an 18-year-old domestic uh, stabbing four times to the chest. She was transported by car to the local ER. From the local ER, they called us up, and we then prepared for her arrival. In the local ER, her Glasgow was fine. Her blood pressure is 50 over 70 with a pulse of 140. What do you make of those vital signs? Shock. And not a little shock. She's in bad shock. She has two stab wounds near the sternum. When they're close to the sternum, we start thinking about the heart. Uh, correctly, the ER intubated the patient because of airway control, because of her blood pressure and pulse. And they started blood products. They did an initial blood count over there. Her blood count was seven. It's half normal, which is really bad, and she was acidotic. And then they transported her to us. The, the question on our end was we were concerned about a heart injury. So uh, upon arrival to our ER in Phoenix, she had injuries on the chest, one above the sternum, one just to the side of the sternum, she had one in her left shoulder and one in her scapula. And her blood pressure after transport at best was 68 with a pulse of 130. She was still in the same level of shock. In flight, it was probably a little bit worse. Her Glasgow coma scale was three, and she was not on any paralytics, and her pupils, we think, were for the most part fixed. Why do you think um, that Glasgow was three with her pupils being fixed at this point? Anybody want to guess? No blunt trauma, which would be a question, did she fall down and hit her head? Uh, that didn't happen, and she was not getting paralytics. Um, she hadn't really gotten anything because she was so unstable. That would be a question. So it wasn't medication, it wasn't paralytics, it wasn't blunt trauma. What happened with her vital signs? That, look at the vital signs upon arrival at the other ER. Remember, she's driven by car. That's the best blood pressure they got there. That's the best blood pressure we got there. In between, there's transports on either end. 
the kind. Lack of blood. Yeah, lack of blood. So this could be an anoxic brain injury. We, you don't really know right then and there. you got to treat them. But we were pretty disappointed to see her Glasgow 3 with no paralytics, no narcotics, no head injury. Um, so the concern was she's potentially brain dead already by now. But you still have to treat them. So we had prepared by having the heart surgeon ready to go and the OR is ready to go. So we essentially, I took her to the OR myself, and the heart surgeon was up there ready to meet us. We gave her more blood and went straight to the OR. As soon as we got her off the gurney, uh, her blood pressure went to zero. As we moved her over from the gurney to the OR table, so the heart surgeon was changing. He wasn't in the room. Uh, I was there. We took something we don't have in the ER. We have electrical saws that are in the OR, and we opened up her sternum um, with just splashing a little bit of betadine on her chest. And then the heart surgeon came in and helped me out. She was in a traumatic arrest at this point, and we began external and then internal CPR. Once the chest was open, we began ACLS drugs. We did that sternotomy. Um, we de we de uh, de uh, defibrillated her a couple times. And what we found was this. <clears throat> her main injury was right here. There was an aortic tear that was bleeding all over the place. The other injuries were minor. The one on her left sternum had caused a laceration to the lung, which we stitched. And that's why she had a pneumothorax. But this was the big injury. And sometimes you, the injury, this is not easy because this is in three dimensions. This is in the crotch of the, if you want to use that term, the crotch of the aorta, way down deep. And I, the heart surgeon was able to put stitches in this without going on bypass. So we got stitches in there, fixed that, we fixed the lung. We got her stable and took her to the ICU. But in the ICU, her pupils remained fixed and dilated. As you suspected, we suspect a hypoxic brain injury because of all the transport time, despite everybody doing a good job, and she was pronounced dead. So I think this is a, a pretty interesting case, despite all efforts, blood pressure still is key, and her blood pressure never really got above 50. Uh, next case was local to here, 67-year-old male, fell down a hiking trail. I forgot the height. He had chest and lower back pain. In the ER here, his blood pressure was fairly good. His pulse is up a little bit, either from super early shock or just from pain. Just like the field, he had chest wall pain, lower back pain. His hemoglobin is normal. He got a few x-rays that were normal, and I'll show you the positive ones. He has a lumbar number four fracture right there. If you look really closely, you could see a crack going through it. And it's wedged. So it doesn't look rectangular. In the middle, it looks a little bit wedged. It should look like a rectangle. That's an old scar. So this is but what it should look like. So more than likely what happened is when he fell, he fell forward and flexed L3 and L5, competed and beat up L4 and smushed it in the back. And so this is more of a, of a flexion injury on L4 as opposed to a blunt force striking from the back. So he's got a stable L4 fracture. And then he has uh, five rib fractures on the right. Here's an example of one of the rib fractures seen on CAT scan. You know it's towards the back because there's the spine. So that's a cut through the chest wall in the back. That is blood. So he's got a small hemothorax back there. And this is a pretty cool picture. Normal lung, blackness, he has a medium-sized pneumo. So rib fractures, hemo and pneumothorax required a chest tube. So we didn't see that on his initial chest x We didn't think it was that bad because he had chest x-ray, then CAT scan, and then you see the chest tube. So chest tube came after the CAT scan, and the chest tube is in good position. Now there's no blood. This is a little bit of blood in one of the fissures, a little crack. It's, it's a normal anatomic crack. So that blood is, that's blood, but it's kind of leftover blood. So for the most part, the blood is gone and the pneumothorax has been gone with the chest tube. So in summary, this is, how old was this guy? He was um, 67, fairly healthy. So probably like the new 50. He has fairly simple Injuries, five rib fractures, 
a hemoneumothorax with a chest tube, and then a stable L4 fracture. Got infected. Remember I told you about anything? I told you about this about an hour ago. Anytime time we do something, something can go wrong. This guy got two problems. First problem is, or got one problem. He got an infection from the insertion of the chest tube. So no matter how sterile we are, something can happen. It's not the most sterile environment in the ER. And he got a thoracic infection, had to go on antibiotics. Because of the antibiotics and the infection, that's pus draining, draining out. So to, to get the pus out of there, you have to leave the chest tube in even longer. So he was in the hospital for 17 days. If he hadn't gotten infected, probably would have been out in four, five, or six. So anything can go wrong. And an infection is a side effect of a chest tube. Uh, next case, we'll show you, I think, another complication. 43-year-old male stabbed with an ice pick, left and right side. He was intoxicated. He was in combative. He was at our sister hospital, Valley View. Uh, they did a really good workup. They put chest tubes in for pneumothoraxes because he's combative, properly intubated him for protection and flight. This is before they put in the CAT scan or the chest tube. And it's really a cool film. Here's a pneumothorax that is not going to be seen on a chest x ray. Here's a pneumothorax that's not going to be seen on a chest x ray. What is this? That's air. That's crepitus. Correct. That's a visual impression of crepitus. So you would. You would feel this if you touched his chest wall. Whenever you feel crepitance, you got to think that there's a pneumo there of some sort, and it can be a pending tension. So Valley View puts in two chest tubes. Here's his chest tubes, um, and they get him prepared. Here's his intubation right there, ET tube. They got a nasal gastric tube going down to his stomach. It's a great preparation for flight, get him stable. A uh, little trick question for you guys is what this little line is here. Chest tubes um, all have these radiopaque lines, these little white lines that are on every chest tube so we can see the chest tube on x-ray. That's what that line is. And then there's usually a break in the lines. If you see right there, the line is disrupted by a centimeter. That is the indication of where the holes in the chest tube are. Because all the chest tubes have multiple holes at the end to drain out air and fluid. Those holes are all down here. And the reason that line is there is because we now know that it's in far enough. If I saw that line here, that means I got air holes outside the chest and my chest tube's in the wrong spot. Kind of a little piece of trivia. So he comes to have us do... We can sort of sit back and drink coffee. We're at the trauma center, but they did all the work. He's got some lacerations that are small. We sutured those up. The chest tubes are functioning properly. By now, he's awake and cooperative, and the flight is over with, so we were able to extubate him. He was amped up on amphetamines and uh, pot. His alcohol level is normal. So um, this is Havasu's chest x-ray, basically the same as Valley View's. Again, he's over at our place for trauma center observation. So in summary, he's got multiple stab wounds with pneumothoraxes and drugs on board. So it sounds pretty simple. What do we do? Well, we observe him, and then we're responsible for taking out his chest, chest tubes. And the left one came out okay. This is the film after the left and right chest tubes are taken out. So you take out the chest tubes when you think they're ready to come out, typically one, two, three days later. And... The lung on the left side is totally normal. The lung on the right side is partially collapsed. This yellow line that I put on there is where the top of the lung is because right above the lung is black air showing there's no lung up there. Now, I will admit, I didn't take this chest tube out. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about complications. <laughs> One of my partners did, but I could, this could have happened to me. I've just been joking about this. This guy ended up with a pneumothorax after his chest tube came out, and it's from one of two reasons. One is technique. When you pull out the chest tube, if the patient sucks in some air or coughs or does something funny, as the tube comes out, you could suck in air before you have a chance to put down the gauze. 
That could be one reason why this happened. Another reason could be there's still a small little crack in the lung that's still leaking a little bit of air. Um, in this particular case, is more of the technique. The guy did cough when the tube came out. He ended up with about a 10% pneumothorax after the tube came out. So what happens is we just kept him in the hospital for one more day, did another chest x-ray, showing that the collapsed lung was not getting any worse, and then let him go home. So I've shown you two small complications. The worst one was the infection one. And I think, I think we're going to probably stop there because the next one's a little complicated. Anybody have any questions? I think we've covered a lot of ground.